Roughly one in 5,000 clover is a four-leaf clover. Most people that find one pick it up, seal it between two pieces of cellophane tape, and carry it around for the rest of forever in their wallet or purse. Because at those odds, you're pretty lucky to find one, and by extension, that must mean they bring good luck. It's a lovely bit of circular reasoning. Though if it were true, we suppose Edward Martin Sr. of Alaska must have a metric ton of surplus luck by now. Over the course of his life, he's found and kept over 160,000 four-leaf clovers, which admittedly seems pretty lucky, though probably it's just a matter of constantly looking. Or maybe you subscribe to the idea that a horseshoe placed over a door will protect a house and its occupants. Of course, the horseshoe has to be made of iron, and there have to be seven nails in it, and there's some debate about whether the inn should be up to keep the luck in, or down to let the luck run over those passing under. But ever since 10th century St. Dunstan nailed a horseshoe to the devil's foot and made him promise never to enter a horseshoe-protected house, it's been considered lucky and a sign of protection. Then again, maybe you wear a charm bracelet with a dozen little fun-shaped charms on it. Perhaps you've got a religious symbol on a chain around your neck, or you've got a special shirt you wear for those occasions when you really need something to go well. Whatever the case may be, if you have something you believe brings you luck, you've been practicing epitropaic magic. And what you have is an amulet. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Part of the problem when talking about amulets is that very few people know what an amulet actually is. Certainly not the folks who designed D&D. Of the three amulets listed in the 5th edition Dungeon Master's Guide, only one could be construed as a true amulet, the Amulet of Proof Against Detection and Location. It hides you from divination magic and prevents you from being targeted by it. It offers protection from something, which is what real amulets do. They offer some form of protection. What they aren't is any old thing worn around your neck with a bit of magic on it, which seems to be the definition D&D uses. An amulet can come in any shape or size, from your lucky game day socks to the neat rock you found in the woods one day, provided you believe it either protects you from something or makes you luckier, it qualifies as an amulet. In fact, giving luck and preventing bad luck have been the key function of various amulets going back at least as far as ancient Greece and Rome, which is where we get another word for something often confused with amulet, talisman. The chief difference between the two is that while all amulets offer protection and luck, they are not magical items in and of themselves. They generally only operate if they have been in some way blessed, and often only provide their services to those who meet specific conditions, such as being of a particular faith. Talisman, on the other hand, confer their benefits because the talisman itself is magical. They will operate for anyone who possesses one, regardless of other circumstances. Thus, talisman are able to do more than just offer protection and luck. Like D&D's Amulet of the Plains, which, when used, allows someone to teleport around the map and annoy the DM. Really, it should be the talisman of the plains. Talisman and amulets, two different things. Take the rabbit's foot. If you know your superstitions, you'll be aware that the rabbit's foot is believed to bring good luck to those who carry one. Provided, of course, you don't carry more than one which may go some way to explaining why it wasn't very lucky for the rabbit. The belief that a rabbit's foot brings luck is pretty universal at this point, even though it started in early North American folklore. Much money can be made selling rabbit's feet to the eager on every continent, and if you're really lucky, it may even be properly harvested real rabbit's feet. Artificial rabbit's foot good luck amulets are a thing. They're made of fake fur and latex bones, and of course they don't work at all not having been anywhere near an actual rabbit at any point in the process. But even getting a real rabbit's foot doesn't ensure you'll be seeing any improved luck. It all depends on the process used for harvesting the foot. Things are a bit murky on that front. A mix of different traditions coming from various cultures and belief systems have been muddled up through the years. It's become very difficult to tell what will and what won't produce a proper working rabbit's foot. Some instructions say it has to be the left hind foot of the rabbit to even stand a chance of working. And maybe that rabbit had to be caught in a cemetery, at the full moon, on a Friday, 
in the rain? Or was it on a new moon? Or maybe the Friday had to be the 13th. Or maybe you have to shoot the rabbit with a silver bullet. Or, or cut the foot from a still-living rabbit? Whatever the case, and if you can work out exactly what the right method is, you certainly are lucky already. Whatever the case, the theme seems to be that a set of uncanny circumstances has to be in place before the rabbit's foot can be harvested. And it is these circumstances that make the foot lucky. Possibly because one of the things a rabbit could be was a shape-shifted witch. No joke, witches were known to frequent graveyards at both the new and the full moon, and they were known to shapeshift into rabbits, so perhaps the thing you were really doing was taking the left foot from a shapeshifted witch at a time when she was vulnerable, which was very lucky indeed for you, and so made your rabbit's foot a really oh truly oh lucky rabbit's foot. The rabbit's foot wasn't lucky because it was inherently lucky, it was lucky because of the circumstances under which it was acquired. But what about that other word we tossed out in the intro? Apotropaic magic. In Greek, it means to ward off or to turn away, and refers to any magic meant to prevent harm or evil influences. It also shares the same root with the word prophylactic in the sense of turning away. And if you require further explanation of the word prophylactic than that, we can only ask you how the kids are these days. Apotropaic magic can include anything from amulets to simple gestures like knocking on wood or crossing fingers. The ancient Egyptians would perform apotropaic rituals intended to invoke protector gods and thus ward off evil spirits in the home. There was even a special wand for the purpose engraved with symbols and pictures of various protector gods used in special rituals during pregnancies and childbirth. Some of our old friends on this show were used in a similar manner. The Greeks would use images of the Gorgon to ward off evil and included carvings of the Gorgon at the peaks of temples to protect the building. Gargoyles and other grotesqueries, see our gargoyle episode, were used for much the same purpose, to protect entrances and openings in buildings from witches and other evil influences. Basically, anything intended to prevent something bad from happening falls under the category of apotropaic magic, from horseshoes to mirrors, crucifixes to silver bullets, to bent knives, daggers, and swords dredged out in great heaps from under London Bridge, thrown there over the years in hopes of a safe voyage. Apotropaic magic is everywhere from the old world to the new and from ancient times to the modern day. And everyone uses it almost all the time. Don't believe us? Well, consider this. What is it you believe your passwords will do? Because really, your passwords are just amulets, a series of words and symbols that are not in themselves magic, but are believed to offer protection from bad things happening. Like the Seder Square, for instance. The earliest known Seder Square was found in the ruins of Pompeii, and is a 5x5 five five grid of letters. Read from top to bottom, or indeed from bottom to top, the Latin words form a palindrome as follows. Rotus Opera Tenet Arepo Sator. And not only is it palindromic, it has multiple degrees of symmetry, top to bottom, left to right, and on the diagonals. In all, it is a four times palindrome. There are a few translations of what the words mean, but the most commonly accepted one seems to be along the lines of the farmer Arepo uses the plow as his form of work. Which, we have to admit, doesn't sound very exciting or particularly meaningful. It's mostly a nonsense phrase. But that's not the point. The point is that palindromes had power, or rather, using palindromes prevented the use of power by others. The devil, it was thought, would become confused by the repetition of the letters in a palindrome, and so the Sator Square was particularly powerful in that regard. That meant the Sator Square got used in lots of places to protect buildings and remove jinxes, put out fires, and protect cattle from witchcraft. It's been found carved into walls in Rome and affixed to various structures in England, France, Syria, Portugal, and Sweden. It was powerful, and belief in its power was widespread. Naturally, it had to be constructed and used in specific ways to work, but people wrote down this nonsense phrase wherever they needed to protect things. Just like your eight-character mixed-case special symbol including password. The difference between the Seder Square and passwords is... Passwords work best when no one else sees them. And in a similar manner, so do you. 
especially in the Mediterranean and Western Asia, where it is often best to protect yourself from the evil eye. The evil eye is a curse placed upon you by a malicious look from someone who wishes you ill. Done properly, you'll never see it happen. Merely feel its terrible but subtle influence upon your life in short order. Perhaps it will be a series of mild inconveniences which happen periodically, leaving you feeling out of sorts and off kilter, like losing your car keys once a week. Or perhaps you've been hit hard and will be dogged for the rest of your days by illness and the deaths of family and friends. Even our buddy Pliny the Elder, when discussing the various people of the known world, takes time to issue a warning. Isigunus and Nymphodorus inform us that there are in Africa certain families of enchanters who, by means of their charms in the form of commendations, can cause cattle to perish, trees to wither, and infants to die. Isigunus adds that there are among the Tribali and the Illyrii some persons of this description, who also have the power of fascination with the eyes, and can even kill those on whom they fix their gaze for any length of time, more especially if their look denotes anger. The age of puberty is said to be particularly obnoxious to the malign influence of such persons. Which, fair enough, teenagers are pretty annoying. But even something as simple as paying a compliment to someone else might inadvertently raise jealousy in others and earn you an evil eye. Many Muslims, for example, will avoid doing so, instead acknowledging the role Allah has played in providing the admired object or person. Fortunately, the easiest way to ward off the evil eye is to stare right back at it. But since the whole point is to give it to someone without them knowing it, it's difficult to know when or at whom you should be staring. Which is why, in certain parts of the world, you often see a strange blue and white eye affixed to various things. Boats in the Mediterranean, for example, often have an eye painted on their prow, designed to stare right back at anyone who might be looking at the boat and wishing it harm. Confusingly, these are also referred to as evil eyes, but in this case the name is more akin to the way you take cough syrup not to get a cough, but to suppress one and make it go away. The painted on eye's job is to prevent the evil eye curse from landing, and in some cases it is believed that it can reflect the curse right back onto the curse giver. This was also often the purpose of a Viking ship's figurehead, warding off evil. Another widespread popular form of protection against the evil eye is an amulet called a hamsa, which is frequently used by Muslims and Jews. Hamsas are also known as the Hand of Fatima, the Hand of Mary, or the Hand of Miriam, depending on what tradition of faith is followed. First used in ancient Mesopotamia and Carthage, it represents an open right hand with an evil eye embedded on the palm. Right hands were seen as symbols of protection and blessing, and the Hamsa in particular was used to promote fertility and protect pregnancy from evil influences. You'll find them as pendants and wall hangings, and incorporated in a variety of decorations for both personal and household use. And, as its usage grew and spread, the Hamsa took on additional significance, particularly in the Jewish faith. A stylized Hamza doubles as the Semitic letter Shin, making it the first letter of one of several important words, which allowed it to accrue even more significance. Writing Shin by itself is shorthand for one of the names of God, Shaddai. There are hand gestures and positions used to represent letters in the Semitic alphabet, and the one for Shin is used in performing the priestly blessing, which we'll come back to in a bit. And you've seen it, guaranteed, even if you aren't Jewish, because it is exactly the same gesture used by Leonard Nimoy in giving the Vulcan salute on Star Trek. Perhaps the most important amulet ever found, though, was discovered in a place called Ketaf Hinnom, located southwest of the old city of Jerusalem on the grounds of what is now the Menachem Begin Heritage Center next to St. Andrew's Church. Now, before we begin this story, let's just make one thing clear. Your Indiana Joneses and your Lara Crofts, that's not what archaeology is like. Sure, it's fun to watch them running around, barely escaping bad guys, shooting up entire military regiments single-handedly, or destroying valuable and historically important artifacts and ruins, all in the name of collecting the last Cracker Jack secret toy surprise, just so they can do it all over again slightly more efficiently at the next map location. That just isn't how it works. Incredibly valuable treasures of gold and silver consistently fail to turn up at all in real archaeology, 
and if anyone treated archaeology like Lara Croft does, they'd end up in prison in some third world country never to be heard from again. Which is not an exciting and fun video game experience. So you can appreciate the point archaeologist Gabriel Barkai was trying to make in 1979 to his assistant, Gordon Franz, when he said, Remember, archaeology is not a treasure hunt. It requires, as we'll see, careful and methodical processing and recording of data. At its best, all archaeology is likely to turn up is a couple more slightly interesting pots which might or might not tell archaeologists a tiny bit more about the people who made them. Which is what made the kid with the hammer at Katef Hinam all the more annoying. The kid's name was Nathan. He, along with a handful of other local teens, was on a sort of work experience outing. Once a week, they'd come down to the digs at Katef Hinam from the Tel Aviv Society for the Protection of Nature and help excavate the place. Although, mostly what Nathan would do was get bored and then pester Professor Barkai. You know the kid. About every two minutes, he tugs on your sleeve and asks some dingbat question that has nothing to do with anything. Like, hey, Professor, my dad says digging in the dirt for dead guys is dumb. Are you and him going to fight? Or, uh, hey, Professor, do you think that cloud looks like a duck or a deer? And how about, hey, Professor, is it lunchtime yet? Fortunately, Professor Barkai knew exactly what to do with this sort of kid. He handed him a whisk broom and sent him off to sweep out a tomb that had already been cleared. Which, by rights, should have kept the kid busy for a good half hour at least. No one had found anything much at all in any of the tombs they'd cleared out so far. Everything had been looted years and years ago, and anything of any significance or value had been taken long before the professor and his team had arrived. It was pretty much a lost cause, and sweeping out the tomb in question was just busy work to make the kid go away for a bit. Which made it all the more annoying when Nathan returned just a few minutes later and tugged on Barkai's shirt. By now, the professor was pretty hot under the collar, and he whipped around to yell at the kid. But instead, he turned and froze, because in Nathan's hands was a very small, very delicate pot. Nathan explained. He was bored and knew he'd been given busy work. Fortunately, someone had left a hammer laying around where Nathan could get at it. And in his boredom, he began banging it around the floor of the tomb he'd been told to clean. Next thing he knew, a bit of floor fell in and revealed a small chamber, which turned out to be full of ancient, very ancient, pottery. As you can imagine, the professor was instantly intrigued and went to investigate. Sure enough, a room below the floor of the tomb was revealed. Inside it were bones and pots moved out of the main tomb to make way for the more recently deceased back in the day. Part of the ceiling had caved in at some point, covering everything over, protecting it from tomb raiders and preserving the contents. Barkai quickly organized a work group to record, collect, label, and prepare the articles inside the tomb. The group was headed by one of Barkai's associates, a man named Gordon Franz, and made up of three of the teens helping at the site. All the objects were to be recorded, not only in terms of a general description, but also with regard to their location and position within the cave. The problem was, the kids couldn't speak English, and Franz didn't speak Hebrew. It wasn't long before things were getting messed up. By the next day, the kids were replaced with adults from the Institute for Holy Land Studies. After that, things went much more smoothly, which was just as well, because what they started finding was exactly the sort of thing that the professor said archaeology wasn't about. Bronze and silver artifacts started coming out of the hole, badly corroded, but still very much like treasure. Then out came a shiny gold earring with not a spot of tarnish on it. Now the worry was about actual tomb raiders, if the local population were to hear what was coming out of the cave, there'd be trouble. So they took to using code words. Silver was gray matter, gold was lemon, coins were buttons, and bones were referred to as Napoleons. For the next four days, they worked for 12 hours straight in two groups, one digging inside the caves and one sifting through the removed material for anything they might have missed. On Saturday morning, Six days after the initial discovery, archaeology student, now professor, Judy Hadley, was working the dig and brushed aside some dirt 
to reveal a small gray cigarette butt. At least that was what it looked like at first. Careful inspection revealed it to be a small, tightly rolled scroll made from what appeared to be pure gray matter. But it was too dirty and brittle to be unrolled and examined thoroughly. It was barely an inch wide and less than half an inch in diameter. Shortly thereafter, a second silver scroll was discovered by the team working the sifting table. It was even smaller. Other objects were discovered as well, but these two scrolls would become one of the most important archaeological finds ever. But they still didn't know exactly what they were. It was clear that they had each been tightly rolled around a string or cord and worn around someone's neck, but no one knew what or even if anything was written inside them. It would be three years before anyone dared to find out, because no university or museum wanted to touch them for fear of permanently damaging the fragile objects. It wasn't until 1982 that people at the Israel Museum finally agreed to do it. The first scroll turned out to be nearly four inches long once it was finally enrolled. The second, smaller scroll was barely an inch and a half in length. There appeared to be faint scratches and lines that might, maybe, be writing. But it wasn't until the scrolls were examined under a microscope that their true importance would be discovered. The thin lines were identified as Paleo-Hebrew writing, ancient Hebrew, and both scrolls were covered in it. The very fine, delicate lines were hand-inscribed on the silver itself, and four letters jumped out at Barkai. He knew them instantly. Together, they spelled out the name of the Lord, Yahweh. In total, the name appears three times on the largest scroll, but for a long time, that was all anyone knew about it. The scrolls were so old and so worn out that it was very difficult to assemble the other visible words into anything meaningful. By now, though, the scrolls had been pretty well dated, mostly thanks to the careful record-keeping of Gordon Franz. The archaeologists knew the burial caves had been carved out in the mid-7th century BCE. The pottery collected was dated to three separate periods, the first at the end of the Iron Age, about 587 BCE, the second dated to the Babylonian period, or that period in time when Judeans were in captivity in Babylon, and the third period, and smallest collection of eight pieces of pottery, was placed in the Hellenistic period, roughly 323 BCE to 31 BCE. Since the scrolls were found at almost the lowest point in the cave, it meant that they had been among the very first things thrown in, and thanks to the careful records, that meant they were from the late 7th century BCE, nearly 2,600 years old. And the reason all that mattered so much, and why it made the two silver scrolls the most important amulets ever found? Because when folks were finally able to figure out what the scrolls had inscribed on them, it turned out to be the very same priestly blessing we mentioned before. And that's important, because the words of the priestly blessing come from the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 23 to 27, making the scrolls the oldest biblical texts ever found. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the sons of Israel, and I then will bless them. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of GM Word of the Week. We hope you had a good time with it. If you did, we have a small favor to ask you. Take just a moment to leave a rating and a review wherever you happen to get the episode from. It can be anything, really. A thumb, a star, whatever works. If the show makes you want to say things about it, that'd be cool to write down, too. We'd really appreciate it, because it helps more people find the show. Think of all the good feelings you'd help spread. If you're not sure where to go to rate the show... We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play. We've noticed that a lot of other podcatchers have rating systems, too. Those are all good. Whatever you can do to help is fine. Thank you. 
And thank you as well to our patrons on Patreon. They're amazing people, and we're always happy to meet and greet any new additions to our little family of supporters. Join them by heading over to our website at gmwordoftheweek.com to get the details. Thanks again. This episode was written, researched, and produced by me, Brian Casey. Today's music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions and Epidemic Sound. To love is the great amulet that makes this world a garden.